y el Señor se, se mueve en medio de nosotros pero anda buscando un corazón un corazón abierto un corazón dispuesto un corazón que anhele su presencia y estamos aquí delante de ti Señor para darte gracias para honrarte y glorificarte y solo para decir que que te anhelamos que estamos perdidos sin ti que no hay nada que podamos hacer si tu presencia no está con nosotros si no estuviéramos conectados a ti Sería imposible hacer las cosas que hacemos. Hay que aprovechar estos momentos donde el Espíritu de Dios se está moviendo. Cuando el Espíritu de Dios quiere hacer cambios radicales en nuestras vidas. Donde el Espíritu de Dios quiere venir a traer esa sanidad espiritual. Donde quiere sanar todas las heridas del pasado quiere traer estabilidad emocional, estabilidad espiritual a nuestras vidas, para poder tener un mejor caminar con Él. Padre, en el nombre de Jesús, Señor, te damos gracias, Padre, por todo lo que estás haciendo, Señor, aquí en medio de nosotros, Señor. Te damos gracias, Señor, por moverte de una manera sobrenatural, Espíritu puede tocar nuestros espíritus, Señor, y traer, Señor, esa libertad que tanto anhelamos, Padre. En el nombre de Jesús, Señor, yo te pido por todos los que están aquí presentes ahora, Señor, por todos los que no pudieron atenderse. seconds more. Can we just all raise our hands and just be able to say, God, we love you. God, we exalt you. God, you are supreme and sovereign over everything. You are in control over everything. We don't worry about anything because you are in control. We 
belong to you. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. We pray for our nation today. We ask you, Father, that your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. We pray that your will be done in this election cycle. Yes, Father. We pray that your will be done in the lives of every person that voted. We pray, Father, that you take control over out of uh, out of the entire situation that is happening, and we submit everything to you, Father. We submit everything to you because you are our champion and you are the perfecter of our faith. There is no one else that we can go to but you, Father. Because only you have the words that bring eternal life. Only you have the words that bring peace and joy and love. Only you have the words, Father, that can speak to our spirit. In the name of Jesus, thank you. Thank you and thank you for everything that you're doing. Amen. Can we give God a round of applause? He deserves it. Amen and amen. Welcome everybody to House 633. Um, such an honor to be here today and be able to uh, minister uh, to God and to you guys. Um, it is such an honor uh, to be here at the head of, of this church of House 633. I'm so thankful and grateful for the lives of everybody that is here. I'm so grateful for the lives of everybody that wasn't able to make it tonight. We pray for them. Uh, we ask God to uh, send love and peace and joy and comfort uh, their way, wherever they may be, in their homes, on the road, at their work job. Uh, we're just so blessed. Man, what a night. What a, what a, what a, yeah, what a crazy couple of nights it's been. I want to continue uh, today with the, with a message and, and I want to just finalize it because I want to get into the next series or the next couple of uh, messages that God has put in my heart uh, to speak of. Um, I, I just want to finish this one and kind of just drive it home. Uh, and the title is, How Do We Fix Lukewarmness? Because we've been talking about the lukewarm believer or the lukewarm Christian. And we've been looking at all the different uh, uh, los sintomas. Uh, what do you call it in English? I'm blanking out. The symptoms uh, of a lukewarm believer or citizen. Uh, so we now, I want to talk a little bit about how to fix that. Uh, what, what is the requirement or what is it that God is looking for? Or how does God, or how do we solve that issue in our lives and in uh, this generation? But before uh, we get into the message, uh, I also want to take this time to, um, to just... I think just to bring awareness, and like I said, I don't. I, I think everybody's already in the mix of everything. You know, we're in the mix of a, a crazy political cycle. Uh, uh, the nation is going through uh, a lot of uh, upheaval, a lot of chaos. Uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that were exposed during this election cycle, and I think that it's time uh, for somebody uh, to just. 
uh, generally just to call out and just say it's time to heal. Uh, it's just time to uh, come together. Uh, it's time to like let's let's forget about Joe Biden and let's forget about Donald Trump and let's forget about the Republican Party. Let's forget about the Democratic Party. Let's just forget about politics in general. And and let's come back to where God has called us to have our eyes set at. And that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Uh, during this election cycle, it's, it's been very uh, heated debates, very heated emotions, very heated uh, discussions with people. Uh, people unfriending people simply because of their political beliefs. Uh, people not wanting to be friends with people simply because of their political uh, ideology, uh, simply because they're voting right or voting left. Uh, and in reality, if you're a kingdom citizen, uh, you're not a Republican and you're not a Democrat. You're, you're actually, we were called to actually represent the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul says that we are ambassadors yeah. but we're not ambassadors of the United States and we're not ambassadors of Central America or Mexico we're ambassadors of the kingdom of God so I would say to everybody that that is within the Christian sphere uh, I know that there are people that voted Republican people that voted Democrat I, I would actually call both of you guys to kind of abandon that political stance and I will call you guys to come back into the kingdom of God and be able to represent the kingdom with the same passion that you represent your, your political beliefs. Yes. Yes. With the same passion and, and commitment that you have represented your political party, I'm actually now calling on you guys to come back and, and submit to the kingdom of God. And I ask you guys to now represent the kingdom with that same passion, that same fervor, and that same determination and then be able to be, be considered worthy of that title of ambassadorship. So, like I said, I know it's a crazy time. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit crazy for a, a couple of days, or maybe even weeks, depending on how long this, this, uh, uh, you know, this recount or these challenges go. But in the meanwhile, I, I ask and I call everybody that calls themselves sons and daughters of God to come back to God. To come back and, and start worshiping God, to start come back and start praying for our nation, pray for Joe Biden, pray for President Trump, pray for the, the different parties, pray that, that they are able to recognize who is really in charge and who is really in control, be, uh, you know, at the other side of all of this, and that is God himself. God is the one who chooses and, and puts kings, and God is the one who dethrones kings. He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, uh, he will stay in power because even though these two political candidates, they're fighting uh, for your vote. Uh, something that I love about the kingdom of God is that you cannot vote Jesus into power. Yes. Amen. He is king. Amen. Whether you voted for him or whether you did. Yes. Jesus Christ uh, was born to rule, was born to to be able to be the sovereign of the world. So I call everybody to come back and serve the one true God, Amen. Jesus yeah. Christ yeah. himself. Yeah. So, yeah. Stop being disappointed. Stop being angry. Stop being so uh, uh, sentimental <laughs> uh, and, and being uh, so upset over what's going on. Because all and everything that's happening is simply a reflection of the people. And the people are in that condition. And that's why there's chaos there. But if the people were to come back to God, and it says that, that those that were called in accordance to his name were to humble themselves and cry out to the Lord, he will come down and heal our land. Our land needs healing. But the only one that can heal our land is Jesus Christ himself. Yes. And, but he will not come down to heal it if the people that bear his name don't call upon him. 
Some of us are waiting for Donald Trump to save us. Other people are waiting for Joe Biden to save us. But the Bible says that there is only one person that can save us, and that is Jesus Christ. So, having said that, let's let's get in, in into the Word. If you can come with me to the Book of James, chapter four, verse seven. The Book of James, chapter four, verse seven. And we are talking about how do we fix lukewarm, mm, so lukewarmness. Because believe it or not, everything that is happening around the world is a reflection of the lukewarmness of the church. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Wow. Yes. The reason we are going through all this suffering and this pain and this chaos is simply because the church is lukewarm. So how do we fix it? How do we correct it? How do we get everything back in order and back in line to how God wanted it wanted it to be? So if we if we're ready, James chapter 4 verse 7 says these words. So then, surrender to God, stand up to the devil and resist him and he will turn away and run away from you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everything that you're doing. I ask you, Lord, to prepare the minds and the hearts of the people that are presently here with me. Father. Yeah. And I ask you to prepare the minds and the hearts of the people that are listening through social media. Father. I ask you, Lord, to give us a teachable heart so that we can be able to receive your instruction, but also to receive your correction. So that we can be able to turn our hearts back to you and be able to follow you and walk within the parameters that you have already set for us and not waver from them, Father. Yes. In the name of Jesus, Father, I ask you, Holy Spirit, for you to teach, for you to speak, for you to deliver so that the people might be convicted and might turn back to you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Yeah. All right. I, I, I am very uh, excited. I am very pumped up. You know, I, we've been talking um, about lukewarmness and we've been talking about different topics. And I just keep on seeing how, how God is directing, how God is leading, how the Holy Spirit is taking us um, in wrapping us up into in his concepts and his ideas, uh, how he is leading us into a holy life, simply because of the calling that each and every one of us has in our life. In case you didn't know, uh, God wants to use your life. God wants to use you in a way that you don't even imagine how he how he what he's going to do with you. The Bible says that your thoughts are not his thoughts and his thoughts are not your thoughts. There's another scripture where it says that what eyes have not seen and ears have not heard or things that have even crept up to the imagination. Those are the things that God has in store for those that love him. So every time that we come to the house of God, and every time that we come and, and we start hearing his voice and we start hearing his commands and we start hearing his laws, the only reason we, we feel that God is timing it is out there, the only reason we might feel uh, like, like we're, we're getting like whipped or corrected or, or we're getting conflicted is simply because there is a special calling in our lives that God wants to make sure that we fulfill. There's a lot of people that don't understand how God works or how He functions. People think that God is a God of disorder, but God is a God of order. Yes, amen. So He will never work in a. He will never call. Oh, let me let me correct this. He calls everybody because the call is out there. Everybody is welcome. Everybody is a, is entitled by right because we are created by God. We we have His nature and His image by 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 nature. 
So he makes a call for every single one of us. But when we get that calling from God, he wants to bring order and structure to our lives in order for us to be able to be faithful to the assignment that we have for our lives. Because every single one of us, whether you're young or whether you're old, we all have an assignment that we have to fulfill uh, and accomplish for God before he comes back to earth. And, and, and that is, is the reason why the message of the kingdom is such uh, is so important in our generation, in our time. Because the message of the kingdom is what brings revelation of our assignment here on earth. Yes. The message of the kingdom is what, is what opens our eyes so that we can see that there is something more to the cross than just the cleansing of our sins. Uh, the message of the kingdom is what allows us to understand that, that Jesus Christ is the door. And what he wants us to do is to be able to cross to that door into the visible or the invisible realm of the kingdom that is present in the visible realm. It is the message of the kingdom that gives us the understanding that even though everything came out of the invisible, everything came out of the spiritual realm, God works in the visible realm first yes. in the physical realm so God wants to correct and bring order to the to 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 our lives in order for us to be able to fulfill and accomplish our assignment our assignment is so important to God that he was willing to leave heaven yes. and didn't consider it uh, to uh, didn't consider it enough to be just like God as to something to hold on. But he said, I will go down to the earth and I will give you, when he was talking to the Father, I will do for you what nobody else is doing. I will submit to your authority and I will become obedient up Amen. until death. Yes. No matter what it takes, I will obey. So if Jesus Christ our Lord and our King, our Savior, the person that we say that we follow, if He had to leave earth in order for us to finish our assignment, imagine how important our assignment is. Amen. Because the religious system, the religious uh, people or teaching, what they tell us is, Jesus Christ simply came to die for your sins, and all you need to do now is wait. All you need to do now is wait for the trumpet to sound, and then you're going to be taken when he comes. And you don't have to do anything. It is not through works. It is through grace. There is nothing that you have to do. All you have to do is believe and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you're done. And, I, and, I, and I'm here to tell you that... that Partially, that is true. Partially. Because, yes, there is no work that we can do to acquire salvation. Salvation is a gift given by God. So there is no work that you can do to obtain salvation. But here is where it gets tricky for the people that are in the religious system. The kingdom brings us a, a revelation that once we have received the gift of salvation, the purpose of salvation was so that we can go back to work. Yes, amen. So we don't work to be saved. We get saved so that we can go to work. Yes, amen. Good. <coughs> so we have people battling ideologies and ideas and philosophies that have been spanning for the last hundred years, and they're like, oh, let's go theology here again. And I hate to go there, but it's the only way I can go. Theology, they come in and tell you, oh, solo, solo gracia, or, or solo salvation, solo Christ, solo this, solo whatever, and they battle this idea in, in theology uh, that you don't have to do any works to be saved. Yes, you don't have to do any works to be saved. That is a gift from God. Let's get past that. Yeah. Why did you get saved? And why did Jesus come from heaven to the earth and die on the cross to give you salvation and get you from a place where you were worthless and you weren't able to serve him or do anything for him and get you into a position that you can now do something? Mm. 
So God came and gave us salvation so that we can get back to work. Yes. The Apostle Paul put it this way. How works or faith without works is dead. I'll show you my faith by my works. Yes. The works don't save you. The works give testimony that you've been saved. Yes. If you're not working, then you might have not been saved yet. Because when you get saved, then the Bible says that we go back into the way that we were created. The Bible puts it in this way. It says that we are God's workmanship. Yes. We were created for good works that were prepared for us even before the foundation yes. of the world. So it means that there were works that we were supposed to have supposed to be yes. doing now that we were not doing simply because we were lost. Amen. Yes. None of the things that God has designed for us to do were getting done or accomplished because we were not in position. We were not in our assignment. We were lost. We were in a different location. So Jesus Christ had to come back. He had to go look for us. He had to find us. He had to save us. And he had to reposition us. Yes. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that we can now finish the works that were prepared for us even before the foundation of the world. Yeah. So, let's understand this. You don't do works to get saved. Being saved is a gift. Yeah. But you also need to understand this. If you have been saved, you have to work. Yes. You cannot be in your local church Saying that you're saved and not working. You cannot be in your family saying that you're saved and not working. You cannot be in your house saying that you're saved and you're not working. You cannot be at your job saying that you're saved and you're not working. You cannot be in the world saying that you're saved and you're not working. Now, let's define work. Work is not your job. Your job is something that you get paid to do. It's what you do from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's what you do from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. It's what you go out there to do. It's when you go out there and you exchange your time for money. You're out there in a job. That is not work. That is your job. So you, many people think that they're working because they have a job. And that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that work is the assignment that God saved you for. Yes. Wow, wow. So if you have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you have a job, now God is asking, why aren't you working? Where is the work that I have already predestined, that I have already prepared for you. Even before the foundation of the world for you to be walking in, where is that work? What's your purpose? Why are you in this generation? What are you supposed to be doing? Because God saved us so that we can work. I hope the people that are here understand it. And I hope that the people that are listening are understanding it. Because there is a lot of work to do. Yes. Jesus Christ says, yes. He said it in this, in this way. He says that, that the harvest is ready. Yes. Oh, that's so good. But the workers are few. Mm -hmm. Pray to the Lord of the harvest so that He can send more workers into His field. The ministry is not a job that you come to get paid for. Mm. Uh -oh. The ministry is work. Yes. It's an assignment. You will do ministry whether they pay you or not. Because it's an assignment. It is what you were set out to do by God. Some people won't come and serve unless they get paid. Mm. <laughs> the Bible calls them uh, salary. Shepherds. Yeah. They're not bad people. But this is the dangers of somebody that has a salary. The Bible says that when the wolf comes 
to try to devour the sheep, the salaried shepherd flees because that's his job. And he's not going to die for his job. Right. That's the... But the, the one that has the calling or the one that is in, in his work, when he sees the wolf come and attack the sheep, he gives his life for the sheep. Because he's not, it's not his job. He's in his work. Yes. So even though it is okay to be able to come to church and say that that's my job, when, the, when things get tough and get rough, you're going to be the first person to run because it's, it's not your work. So God doesn't want to send, doesn't want to give you a job. He wants to give you work. He wants to give you your assignment. He wants to give you, uh, he wants to give you the things that were predestined for you even before the foundation of the world so that you can walk in them now. But how can you walk in them if you're lukewarm? And we already talked a little bit about lukewarmness. It says that a lukewarm person is a spiritual adulterer that is having an affair with the world. It is a person that, that values the, the world's opinions. It is a person that is in relationship with the world. And that's why everything that happens in the world affects them. And that's what I was talking about earlier today. Let's come back to Jesus Christ. Let's heal. Yes. Because if you're being affected because Trump is losing and Biden is winning, that's the world. Mm. Yeah. If you're excited because Biden is winning or, and Trump is losing, that's the world. Yeah. And the Bible says, that it means that you're in relationship with it. Mm. That you have an ungodly, unholy relationship with it. And that is the reason why you can't see God. Mm. Wow. And that is the reason why, why everything around you affects you. When we have Jesus Christ, when he made the prayer to the Father in John 17, he said, They are in the world, but they are not of the world. Meaning, yes, we are in this system. But we don't operate out of the system. We operate out of the system of the kingdom of God. We operate out of a system that is stable. We operate out of a system that is righteous. We operate out of a, a, out of a system that doesn't have chaos or confusion or evil or hate. We're in the world. But since we operate from the world of heaven down here on earth... It doesn't matter what's happening out there. I still have peace. I still love the people. I still love my friends. I, I still want to associate with them. Why? Because whatever happens in the world doesn't determine nothing in my life. The only thing that determines things in my life is whatever happens in heaven. And since Jesus Christ is king, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, nothing has changed. Everything stays the same for me. Because the kingdom is here. The Holy Spirit is in me. So there is no problem in my life. If Trump wins, I'm okay. If Biden wins, I'm okay. It doesn't matter. Because... The one that I represent has been in power before they were even born. Yes, amen. The, the king that I represent and the kingdom that we were called to be ambassadors of has been in power before the earth was even created. It's a stable kingdom. Nothing changes there. The economy doesn't change. The healthcare system doesn't change. The army doesn't change. Nothing changes in the kingdom. Everything's the same. And if I'm in the kingdom, even if I'm walking here on the earth, in this world, nothing is going to touch me or happen to me if the king doesn't allow it. Yes, amen. Mm. So what's the problem? Mm -hmm. Let the world be the world. Let's come back to the kingdom. Yeah. Oh, wow. Let us have peace. Ooh. Let us have joy. Yes. Yes. Let us have tranquility. Let us, let us not be shaken or moved by whatever is happening out there. Do not let the currents of the
the world drag you into chaos. That's why it says, those that understand the message of the kingdom apply it. They are like wise people that, that, wrote, that built a house over the rock. The storms came. The winds blew. The earth shook. And nothing happened to them. Everything is going to shake. Everything is going to move. Everything is going to change. But the one thing that is stable and that doesn't change is God. The one thing that is unmovable is his kingdom. So that's why I keep on telling people, walk into the kingdom. There is no crisis in the kingdom. There is nothing bad happening in the kingdom. Just come into it. And you'll experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. Why aren't, why aren't you getting involved in the political process? Because I'm not of this world. I'm of that world. Yes. And, in, and, and he's already in his place, in his throne. There is nothing for me to do. I just have to keep on representing him. Let's stay firm. Lukewarm believers. And we're talking that lukewarm it means that to have lack of conviction, to be half-hearted, to show no enthusiasm or having zero interest, to be indifferent, to have no zeal for God. Uh, it means that you don't you firmly believe something. Uh, that you're not convinced of error and you can't admit the truth. You're inconsistent. All of these things are signs or of lukewarmness. But God wants to fix it. God wants to correct it. God doesn't want you to stay in that condition. So when we start reading the letter of James here, it starts in this way and I love it. It says, so then, surrender to God. We'll stop just there. We'll break it down slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Surrender to God. What does it mean to surrender to God? To surrender to God means to give God no opposition. Mm, that's good. Don't oppose God. You can't say that you have surrendered to God and be in opposition of Him. At the same time. You can't say that you have surrendered. And at the same time be against God. Makes no sense. So to cure or to fix the lukewarmness. It says surrender to God. Look at the next thing. Stand up to the devil. Stand up to the devil. Mm. And resist him, and he will turn and run away from you. The devil has no power, no authority, nothing over you at all, zero. So God comes and he says, stand up to him and resist him. Resist means is to oppose him. Yes. The devil's going to come. And he's going to try to influence you because he doesn't have authority over you. But he has influence. So he's going to try to influence you by getting you to do the things that he already knows you're weak at. So he's going to try to get you to criticize. He's going to try to get you to hate. He's going to try to get you to slander. He's going to try to get you to drink. He's right. going to try to get you to smoke. He's going to try to get you to, to, uh, to steal. He's going to try to get you to, to come and manipulate. He's going to try here and get you to, to fornicate or adulterate. He's going to come and try to influence you. Because he doesn't have the authority to do it. Or the power. But he's going to try to influence you. So God says, surrender your life to God. Don't give God any opposition so that God can fill you with his spirit. He can fill you with his laws. He can write his laws in your heart. Now, I want you to stand up to the devil. The devil is like a bully. Somebody that looks really big and powerful and you're afraid of. But when you stand up to him, you notice that he's a power. Right. Because it says that when you stand up to the devil and you resist him and you don't get intimidated by him, then he runs away from you. Yeah. 
In other words, in slang, he just comes to punk you. He just comes to intimidate you and to make you think that he's, he has power and authority and to try to get you to do what he wants to do. But God is saying, he has no power. Stand up to him, resist him, and he's a coward. He's going to run away from you because he's going to eventually realize that you have discovered you're the one in charge. He's going to discover that you're the one that has the true power. That you're the one that has the true authority. That you are the one that has the Spirit of God in him. And that he can't oppose you. So when you stand up to the devil and you resist him, the only thing left for him to do is to run. Because he can't do nothing. You don't even have to fight him. Just stand up. Just grab the courage and say, enough, leave me alone. You don't have power or authority over me. And he will flee. Because he's the real coward. He's the liar. He is the prince of darkness. Ignorance. So we come, we surrender to God, we stand up to the devil, we resist him, and he will turn and, and run away from you. Look at what verse 8 says. Move your heart closer and closer to God. Ooh, yeah, man. If you want to abandon lukewarmness, you have to move your, your heart closer and closer to God. Your heart is another word for your mind. Your soul. You have to get your mind, your ideas, your concepts your belief system, your philosophy, closer and closer to God. And, we, and He will come even closer to you. Amen. When God sees that you are getting closer to Him, because you're aligning yourself with His values, with His morals, with His ethics, with His, with His core being, when He sees that you're seeking Him, it says that not only will you get closer to God, it says that when God sees it, God himself starts walking and he starts getting closer to you. Make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure and stop doubting. Why does it say that? Because people might say, it's not that simple, brother. You, you, are you telling me that all I have to do is, is tell the devil to go away and that's it? Yes. Yeah. When did you ever see Jesus battling a demon? Right. Amen. Bring me the person that that demon possessed. Demon, get out. Leave. The demon will leave. Yeah. There was no battle at all. It's not like what we see nowadays. Out in the name of Jesus. Out in the name of Jesus. And then people are fighting for hours trying to cast a demon out. Jesus says, no. Just stand up firm and resist them and he will flee. Get your, your heart closer and closer to me. I will come close to you. Cleanse your life. What is cleansing? It's washing. It's like we were talking about it. The water is in the land. There's work in the land. The things that you can see. You're not a good husband? Start by becoming a good husband. You're, you don't know how to teach your wife? Then start by reading the Bible so you know what to teach her. You don't, you don't know how to lead them in prayer? Well, start praying by yourself so you can learn how to do a prayer. Then start doing the things that you can see. The things that you know that have to be done. And stop waiting for somebody else to do them for you. You have to. Cleanse your life. Wash your life. And keep your heart pure. Yeah. Why? Because our heart represents our mind, our way of thinking. Keep it pure because it's easy for our mind to be contaminated. The reason we sin is because sin is in our mind. We think about it. Oh my God, I'm going to drink again. Oh my God, I'm going to smoke again. Oh my God, here comes this girl again. So what? Stop giving it a power that it doesn't have. Stop giving it the, the value that it doesn't possess. 
You're the one who gives it the power. You're the one who gives it the authority. You're the one who gives it the advantage over you. We need to be able to come back and understand this concept of purification of the mind and stop doubting. I'm going to read this and I'm going to go back to something real quick. Feel the pain of your sin. Be sorrowful and weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning and your joy into deep humiliation. <coughs> be willing to be made low before the Lord and He will exalt you. Until you feel pain in your heart and you feel sorrow for the harm you have made, you will never change. It is not a joking matter. It says, let your joking around. It is not funny that you're destroying your family. It is not funny that you're destroying your kids. It is not funny that you're destroying your wife. No. It is not funny that you're, you're destroying yourself. It is not funny that, that because you're not in your position, other people can't come into their position either. Because people are waiting on you so that they can get in line. And they can't get in line simply because you don't take it serious. So God is saying, you need to feel the pain of your sin. And, and let, let's talk about sin. What is sin? Sin is, is, is missing the mark. So if you guys have ever seen uh, that, uh, what do they call it? That little thing with your shoot, the little darts? Bullseye. Is that what it's called? Bullseye? I don't know the yeah, but when you see the darts, there's like this little ring, and in the center, there's a bullseye. Uh -huh. So you're, the, 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 the main objective is to, is to get the dart and to throw it, and it's supposed to hit on the bullseye right in the middle. That is hitting the mark. If that dart hits anywhere else, it missed the mark. Because the intention is to you to hit the, rim, the, to hit the bullseye. So in the kingdom, or, or when we come back to God, God's intention is for you to hit the mark. It's for you to be able to hit and be in the place He assigned you to be. If you're in any other place other than the place He designed you to be, you're in sin. Wow. Understand this. And this is why I give this warning to the Christian church. The Christian church is filled with people that are not no longer drinking are no longer fornicating, are no longer adulterating, are no longer practicing homosexuality, are no longer adulterers. There are people that are sitting in the benches that come to worship God, that speak in tongues, know how to dance, but they're still out of place. Right. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. And according to the Bible it says that they're still in sin. Because sin is not the fact that you're committing something. Sin is not being in the place where God designed you to be. So the Bible says that as the body of Christ, there are many members. Every member belongs to each other. And every member has a place they have to be. How can the eye say, say I wish I was a nose or a mouth or a hand? Yeah. Everybody in the body of Christ has already a designated area, a designated place that they need to be. But most of us are in the place that we're not supposed to be. And that's why when God comes looking for us, He finds us out of place and He still calls us sinners. Because sinning simply means that I did not hit the mark. That I did not hit the bullseye. That I am not in my assignment. That I am not in my work. That I'm not fulfilling my purpose. But I am still inside a church. Mm. So the Bible comes and, he, and, it, and it gives us this, this uh, warning, I would say. Many in that day will say, Lord, Lord, I cast demons in your name. We healed the sick. We gave food to the poor. We did all of these things in your name. Right. But I will say to them, I never knew you. Because the things that you did were not authorized. They were not designed for you to do. They were somebody else's assignment, but you took their place. Mm. Wow. You did somebody else's assignment and you didn't fulfill your assignment. In another passage, he comes and he says, he gave one one talent, another one two talents, and another one five talents. 
The one who got five talents multiplied them, gave ten talents. The one who had two talents multiplied them, four talents. What did the other guy that had one talent say? Father, I was afraid. I was scared. I know that you're a harsh man that collects where he did not even sow. So I buried it. But hey, guess what? I didn't lose it either. Here you go. Let me get it out of the ground and let me give you back this gift that you gave me. What did the Lord tell him? The Lord is like, you wicked, lazy servant. You didn't want to work. Because multiplying this gift required work. Required for you to be in, in your place. But you couldn't do it because you were out of place and you're wicked and you're lazy. Mm. What's worse is that you knew that I was a hard man. You knew that I was expecting gain. You knew that I was looking for fruit. And even though you knew it, you buried it instead. Yeah. Oh, so now, tie him up and throw him yeah. into the darkness where there is going to be the gnashing and the crying and the weeping and where he's no longer going to be able to experience salvation. But for all of those that were able to work and that multiplied and gave fruit, all of you guys enter into the joy of your Lord. You will be given even more authority in my kingdom because you were able to prove that you were trustworthy with the little. We have to come back to God. And we have to be able to understand that if we maintain ourselves in lukewarmness, we will not be able to find our assignment. We will not be able to find our work. We're not going to be able to fulfill our purpose, even if we were a church. Mm, yeah. Even if we learn to speak in tongues. Even, even if we cast out demons. Listen to this. Jesus Christ came and he gave the, uh, the apostles authority. And you guys have read it. I'm at, you know. And he said, go out and I now give you authority uh, over, the, over the spirits, over the demons, over the sicknesses, over all of these things. Just go out and work. And they went out to different towns. And then Jesus stayed behind. He, because he was... He was coaching them and preparing them and equipping them. So the only way to prepare and equip people was to go out there and let them do the work. So he, he let them go out there and do the work and he waited for them. So Jesus was in the garden waiting for them and all of them come back excited. All of them come back happy. All of them come back like, man, Jesus, everything that you told us, we were able to do. We were casting out demons. We were healing the sick. We were raising the dead. We, we were multiplying. Right? We were doing all of these things, man. It's awesome. We've got this amazing power. And you know what Jesus says? Mm. Why are you guys happy? Mm. Yes. Why are you guys excited about that? Did you know that I saw Satan get cast down from heaven like a lightning bolt? You should be happy only if your name is written in the book of life. Wow, wow. And here we have a bunch of people that are happy because the demons submit to them. But it's your name in the book of life. Oh, here are people that are happy because they're, they're doing miracles and wonders. But it's your name in the book of life. Here are people that are doing all these things in the name of Jesus. But is your name in the book of life? Because the devil was cast down from heaven like a lightning bolt. Yeah, amen. Simply because he thought that he could be just like God. Yeah. Oh my God. He wasn't even given the opportunity to do anything. He just thought. Because the Bible says the minute that it was found in your heart. That minute, that instant, that second, you were cast down to the earth. So the Bible comes and it's giving us a warning and it's telling us we need to get our priorities straight. We need to get everything in line and in order. 
Because the number one thing that should worry us is not who's under us, who's above us, what our signs and wonders are, uh, all of these things that we can miraculously do. The number one thing that should worry us is, is my name written in the book of life? Is my, can Jesus, because we go back to the book of Revelation, it says that the books were opened and the ones as the, uh, and the ones as names were not found in the book of life were now thrown into the second death. So we, we're here in a generation that is battling through lukewarmness, that is battling of lack of conviction. And the Holy Spirit is now coming and is telling you, hey, surrender your life to God. Stand up to the devil. Resist him and he will turn away from you. Bring your heart closer and closer to God and he will even come closer to you. Make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure and stop doubting. Feel the pain of your sin. Be sorrowful and weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning and let your joy into and let your joy into deep humiliation be willing to be made low before the Lord and he will exalt you we need to be able to come back to God we need to be able to come back closer the way that we solve lukewarmness it doesn't start with the multitudes over there it starts with each one of us yeah. individually yeah. It starts the minute that you get, you wake up in the morning. Do, do you start with your life surrendered to God, or you start with your life battling in the morning? Yes, amen. Like you get up in the morning wishing you don't sin, or do you wake up in the morning just saying, "Lord, how am I going to serve you?" Yes, amen. How are we waking up? That's so good. Because some people says, "Oh," and and and, and yes, don't get me wrong. I know it's a it's a process. One day at a time. But how do you wake up? Yeah. Do you wake up already surrendered to God? Because if you wake up surrendered to God, then there's nothing you're going to struggle with that day. But if you wake up and you're not surrendered to God, of course you're going to struggle. Of course you're going to have conflicts. Of course you're going to have bad thoughts. So God is saying, surrender yourself to me so that you can be able to stand up to the devil. Because guess what? When the devil shows up, you're going to be by yourself. When the devil shows up, your pastor's not going to be there. Your mom's not going to be there. Your wife's not going to be there. The son's not going to be there. No one is going to be there. It's going to be you and him. And are you going to be able to stand up to him? And is he going to flee? Or are you going to submit and now start the process all over again? Oh my goodness. What's going to happen? So God is saying, surrender your life to God. Stand up to the devil. Resist him. The devil has no power. I hear people that battle the devil every day, and I'm like, you guys are crazy. I haven't seen the devil in years. I don't even know where he's at, and I don't care where he's at. I just simply know he's not here. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not there looking for him. Because there are people like, man, where's the devil? Let's find the devil. Right. Maybe he's under this rock. Maybe he's under this house. Maybe he's over there. Let's go find him. I'm like, no, go seek the kingdom. Yes. See, that's what the Bible says. Seek the kingdom. Find it. Look for it everywhere until you find it, until you align yourself with it. And then everything else is going to be added onto you. But you wake up in the morning looking for the devil instead of looking for God. Mm. <laughs> that's good. Stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will turn away. From you, and he will oh run from you. Mm. Uh, it's in your Feel the pain. Be sorrowful and weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning, because people think it's funny. It's not funny. I, I, I when I came into the kingdom, it was so serious. It was such a conviction to me. It changed my life around. Because it was no longer a game. It was no longer I'm going to go drink and I'm going to do this. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask for forgiveness. And then I'm going to go do this and I'm going to ask for forgiveness. No. It's like. I wake up every morning. 
wanting to see what I can do for God or how I can make myself yeah. better. But I don't wake up in the morning thinking like, oh, I hope I don't adulterate today. <laughs> yeah. I hope I don't cheat on my wife today. Oh my goodness. Oh man, I, I, I hope I don't steal today. Yeah. I don't wake up this way. I hope I, I'm able to pray today. <laughs> oh God, please give me the streets so I can read your Bible today. I don't wake up that way. Because my life is surrendered to God already. Amen. I read because my life is already surrendered to God. And I read all day. It, it's, not a, it's not a chore. Mm. All right, I got my Bible. I, I already read for 10 minutes. I'm good for the day. I read the Bible all day. Mm. Every moment that I get an opportunity to, I'm reading the Bible. And that's not a problem to me. Because I have a surrendered life to God. It's not like, check, I read the Bible today, I'm done. I won't read it until tomorrow. Because if I read it again, it's a problem. <laughs> no, let's read it. The more you read it, the closer my heart is getting to God, the closer God is getting to me, the more my life gets cleansed, the more pure my heart gets, and the more I stop doubting. The more my trust becomes in, in God, the more I feel the pain of the destruction I have caused. The more I look at my past and I say, oh my God, how could I have done that? How stupid was I? How dumb was I? How could I have done this? Father, forgive me. And I start feeling the pain for the things that I did because now I have the, the cleansing of the word that is purifying my mind and my heart that allows me to see the destruction. But if your mind is not pure, you don't even think you have destroyed anything. Right. You wonder, why is my wife so bitter? I didn't do nothing. Take out those roots of bitterness, woman. <laughs> but you made her bitter. Right. Every single time you did something to dishonor her. Every single time that you went against the will of God. Every single time that you shamed her. And now you want to come and ask her, why are you bitter? Why are you so angry all the time? I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. And they don't understand. They think it's a joke that the woman now is all tied up. Free yourself. But I didn't bind myself. You did. I didn't. I wasn't bitter before you. I was happy. I became bitter after I was with you. So God is saying, stop joking around. Look at, look at all the destruction and mourn and weep. Humble yourselves to me. And if you're humble yourself to me, I will exalt you. I will give you everything that you need. All the revelation, all the knowledge. So that you can now remove the roots of bitterness that you sowed. So that you can unbind the thing that you bound. So that you can heal what you hurt. Mm. How do we cure the gormness? Ephesians 4.17 Ephesians 4.17 So with the wisdom given to me from the Lord, I say, you should not live like the unbelievers around you who walk in their empty delusions. Some people are so ignorant <laughs> that they come and they say, well, I'm just like Paul. I, 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 when I'm with the Greeks, I gotta be a Greek. When I'm with the Jews, I gotta be a Jew. When I'm with the Gentiles, I gotta be a Gentile. But Paul didn't do the sins that they were doing. He, he didn't judge them and he became just like them to win them for Christ. Not to practice the things that they were doing. Right. So he says, you should not live 
like the unbelievers around you who walk in their empty delusions. Look up real quick, Brother Andy, uh, the definition of delusion. I, I wanted to share that because it, it, it says some, it has something very, very impactful. Delusion is an idiosyncratic belief or impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is generally accepted as reality or rational argument. What else? It's typically a symptom of mental disorder. Mental disorder. It says the unbelievers around you walk in their empty delusions, in their mental disorders, and you follow them. Mentally unstable, and you follow them. You know, talking about the elections, I was I was seeing that in this election particularly, um, they voted into uh, I, I don't know if it was the Congress. Yes, it was Congress, I believe. The first tra transgender uh, woman. So here is a man that believes he's a woman. And the people voted for that person to hold power on how to make laws. <laughs> this election also voted... Uh, not only transgenders, but homosexuals, mm -hmm. but lesbians. Yeah. Uh, the, the LGBTQ community was represented very well this election. And they didn't get them there by themselves. It was because the people that don't know God, mm -hmm. the unbelievers yeah. that walk in their empty delusions, voted yeah. them into power. Yeah. Oh. People that, that, that don't understand mental disorder voted him into power because you can't tell me that you believe in science when it comes to the coronavirus but not believe in science when it comes to gender mm. yeah. the science says we should stay locked up because of the spread but the science also says that there's only two genders male and female so why are you supporting binary and all these other stuff? Mental delusions. People that have, have left God. People that have corrupted minds. People that are perverted. And people that, that the Bible describes as... Um, oh my God, I'm blanking out. Um, I'll come back to it. But it, 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 it calls them... Um, Reprobates. A reprobate is somebody beyond saving. You can't save a reprobate because he has already decided this is what I'm going to do. And imagine all of the people that supposedly think or say that they are sane voting these people into power and now they're going to pass laws that are going to affect our children because guess what? They're going to vote for more mental disorder. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to vote against the family. They're going to vote against the marriage. Mm -hmm. They're going to vote and pass laws against what we believe in. Yeah. Yeah. And you decided to vote for them. Simply because you let hate get in the way. So it says, with the wisdom God has given me from the Lord, you should not live like the unbelieving world and, and an unbelieving world around you who walk in their empty delusions. Listen to this. Their corrupted logic, their corrupted, corrupted logic has been clouded because their hearts are so far away from God. Their blinded understanding, understanding and deep-seated moral darkness keeps them from the true knowledge of God. Because of spiritual apathy, they surrender their lives to lewdness, impurity, and sexual obsession. But this is not the way of life that Christ has unfolded within you. 
If you have really experienced the anointed one and heard his truth, it will be seen in your life. For we know that the ultimate reality is embodied in Jesus. People don't read the Bible anymore. People don't teach the Bible anymore either. But the, the but the but the bottom line is that if the church does not speak of these things, then who will? We are the only ones who have the true knowledge of God. We are the only ones that know the will of God. We are the only ones who know the desires of the of the heart of God. We are the only ones that know what God wants to do in the earth. And if we don't tell the world, then the world will never know. So as a pastor, as a leader, I am obligated to come here and be able to tell you guys, God doesn't want you to be lukewarm. He doesn't want you to be half-hearted. He wants you to turn your heart back to God. He wants you to get closer and closer to Him. He wants to give you wisdom so that you do not fall victim to the behaviors of the people of this world that have mental disabilities, I would say. Simply because they don't know the truth of God. And I can't come here and, and be able to say that we're progressing simply because the Bible calls it reprobation. So the world might be applauding that, you know, we, we have binary people in power, that we have homosexuals in power, we have lesbians in power, we have transgender in power. Hooray, hooray, victory for the world. No, it is not a victory for the world. That is moral decay, yeah. and it is going to cause the destruction of our society. And if the church doesn't say something, well, at least I will. Mm. We yeah. were called as a church to be able to speak to the moral fabric of our society and to be able to tell them that you are living in sin and that it's sinful behavior, and you need to repent and come back to God. Yeah. And if you're a Christian that voted for such a person, you also need to repent and come back to God and get your moral straight. Because we were not called as believers to be like the unbelievers around us that have empty delusions. Their corrupted logic has now con con has clouded them because their hearts are so far away from God. We gotta stop letting people that don't know God tell us what God wants. Yes. We gotta stop being afraid of, of being called names. And that's, you know, the, the favorite term right now is Islamophobic or, or homophobic or racist. Oh, I'm not a racist and I'm going to prove to you I'm not a racist. I'm going to vote for you. You've been fooled and manipulated. Yeah. I am not a racist. I'm not a homophobe. I love the homosexual community. And because I love them, I tell them to repent. And I tell them to abandon their sin. And I tell them that they're walking in delusion. And I tell them that they're corrupted. But there is a God that is willing to embrace them and transform them and change them if they turn around. There are very few churches that are preaching and saying this anymore. That's why you have churches with tens and tens of thousands of people. Because you go there to receive a motivational message. Right. But they don't, they don't force you to submit to the will of God. And in the kingdom of God, you have to walk straight. Because, the, right. because it says that why is right. the road yeah. that leads to damnation. Narrow is the gate that leads to the kingdom. Narrow is the gate to Jesus Christ. Very few would find it. So I'm here asking you guys, or, or telling everybody that is listening to me, the, the message of the kingdom is more than you being prosper. It's more than you receiving a healing. It's more than, than you just getting a miracle. It's more than you activating in a leadership role. The message of the kingdom is, can we find your name in the book of life? 
because you have been saved by God, so now you have activated in your work. You're working, yeah. you're activating in the purpose and the calling that I have given you. Are you delivering the message of the king to the nations? Are you delivering the message of the king to your wife? Are you delivering the message of the king to your daughter and to your sons? Are you delivering the message of the, of the kingdom to your family, to your neighborhood, to everybody that can hear you? Or are you simply afraid so you become just like them? What are you doing? Verse 420, it says, This is not the way of life that Christ has unfolded within you. God did not save you and God did not come to abide in you and unfold his life inside of you so that you will join yourself with unrighteous and wicked people. He did it so that you can come into unity with Christ, with, with his righteousness, with his right standing, with his morals, with his values. He didn't do it so that you can come here and, and, and tell people that it's okay to live corrupted lives. He unfolded his life in you. So that you can experience the anointed one and hear his truth. It will be seen in your life for we know that the ultimate reality is embodied in Jesus Christ. Can we see Jesus Christ in you by what you do, not what you say? How dare you speak hate speech? God loves everybody. Love covers everything. Love is what God did when he left heaven to come lay his body on the line so that he can be sacrificed as the Lamb of God, shed his blood so that we can be wiped away of our sins. That's love. He did not want us to stay in that condition. So he gave his life so that our condition can change. And he has taught you to let go of the old of to let go of the lifestyle of your ancient man, the old self-life, which was corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring for that spring from delusions. So he came and he's telling you that he's unfolding in you and he revealed Christ to you so that you can abandon the old lifestyle, the old man that is corrupted by sinful desires that springs forth from where? Delusions. And what is delusion? A mental disorder. Condition. Now it's time to be made new by every revelation that has been given to you. So you stop being lukewarm. When you start becoming new, you are born again by the revelations given to you, not the knowledge. If you're not receiving the revelation of the kingdom, how can you become new? You will know everything about Jesus Christ, the apostles, the Bible, the history, everything, and you'll stay the same because there's no revelation. So he's saying that the time has, now is the time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you. So if you're here listening to me and you're listening to the message of the kingdom, you're receiving revelation and it's time for you to become new. It is time for you to change. It is time for you to abandon the old habits. It is time for you to put the old man behind. It is time for you to abandon the corruption that has kept you in the condition for all of these years. It is time to, re to use the revelation that you're getting to become you. And to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life and live in union with Him. For God has recreated you all over again in His perfect righteousness and you now belong to Him in the realm of true holiness. So discard every form of dishonesty and lying so that you will be known as one who always speaks the truth 
for we all belong to one another. Don't tell me you can't change. I won't accept it. Don't tell me you can't leave your old habits behind. I won't accept it. Don't tell me that your struggle is too big. I won't accept it. Because the kingdom doesn't accept it. It's not acceptable. Because if Christ is in you, if He's unfolding in you, if you have Christ within you, and, and you now have a union with Him, He has recreated you all over in His perfect righteousness. If you have Christ in you, you're a new creation. Not when you get to heaven. Now. You don't have to do the things of the flesh that corrupt you. You can now come back into union with Christ because you belong to Him and now you can become holy with Him. So it is time to discard every form of dishonesty and lying so that you will be known as one who always speaks the truth. For we all belong to each other. It is necessary for you to become who God called you to be because there is something that you guys are carrying that I need. And I would never be able to eat of it if you don't become what God has called you to be. The reason you guys are able to eat of the fruit of what I'm producing is simply because I allow God to transform me and change me. So now you can eat the fruit. But my fruit wasn't for me. My fruit was for you. But your fruit is for me. So you need to produce your fruit. Because we belong to one another. You are carrying something that is needed in the body of Christ. That needs to be given birth to. And it needs to be released. Because other people from the body need to eat of it. So that they can sustain themselves. So that they can have life of Christ in them. So that they can walk firm with Christ. And if you don't produce your fruit. It means that they can't eat. And you are keeping somebody from the true knowledge of God. So we need to come back to God and come back into union with God. Leave lukewarmness. Allow Him to change and renew our minds and allow Him to unfold His truth in us so that other people may join us and participate in the truth. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity that you have given me to be out here tonight, Father. I thank you for your word and I ask you, Father, to allow the people that have heard this word, whether through social media or whether here in person, Father, for this seed to land on fertile soil, Lord, so that they might produce fruit that is worthy of you, Father, that they might produce fruit at 30, 60, or even 100% of what they have been sowed into, Father. We ask you, Lord, to bring them into unity, into holiness with you, Lord so that they might discover what you are unfolding in their life, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we declare a blessing over everybody that is here. And we declare a blessing over everybody that is watching over social media. Amen and amen. We will see you Friday. All right, let's give a big round of applause to God. Man, thank you for your word. Thank you, Pastor. Um, God is good, man. God is amazing. Um, we are going to close out the service by collecting the offering. Um, as you guys know, in this house, we give out of honor to God. Um, we don't give out of manipulation. We don't give uh, to force God to give us something back. Um, we give just out of honor to God and thanking Him and just showing Him how much He is worth to us. You know, sometimes we put so much work on other things um, that really aren't worth much, um, but God was worth everything. He deserves it all. Um, and if you're watching online and this has blessed you, you can go ahead and give through Zell at Honor Seed. Honor Seed at house633.com. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes.
thank you, Father God. Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for this word that you have given us, Father God. We just pray, Lord, that we not be lukewarm citizens, Father God. Let us be citizens that are on fire for you, Father God. Citizens that are guided by your Holy Spirit, Father God. Citizens, Lord, that do your will and only your will, Father God. We thank you for all the seeds that are being planted in your kingdom, Father God. May those seeds grow, grow on fertile soil, Father God, and be able, be able to produce 30, 60, and 100 fold, Father God. Us as citizens of your kingdom, Lord, all our duty is to seek your kingdom, Lord, because we know that everything else is going to be added on to us, Father God. Help us in our daily life. Seek you more, Father God. Give you the time that you need, Lord, in your word and in reading, Father God. We thank you and we love you, Lord. And we just bless your name, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.